Hello and welcome to the TTI Distribution Download, the podcast where we talk about all things happening in the world of electronic components with the specialists of TTI. My name is Pat Denton. I am the Director of Sales and Engineering here at TTI. With us today from the Agio Group are Peter Blaze, Senior Director, Head of Digital Development and Technical Marketing, and Simon Reuning, Global Technical Marketing Manager with the Agio Group. And the topic of our third episode today is uh, embedded controllers. In the first two episodes, we discussed big power and little power. So in this one, we're going to talk about embedded controllers. So everyone is talking about AI and machine learning these days. Uh, How have recent advancements in embedded controller architecture kind of reshaped the possibilities for industrial and consumer uh, applications? Well, we talked about it in the last episode about sensors and getting more inputs. Well, that's the nervous system of factory automation. But somewhere there has to be a brain that makes decisions based on that. And by implementing something like AI in factory automation, that will actually allow the tool to modify its processes and be more efficient as it goes through it. Because it can learn on its own to figure out, hey, this process is not as efficient as it should be. I have more sensor inputs. Maybe I should reroute something or I should modify something. And that's one of the huge benefits that you can actually use AI for in factory automation. So let's look at the actual facility. And so I want to take a step back and take a big picture perspective. So we've got an automated factory. This automated factory, you've got big power coming into it. You've got big drives that are moving around and doing big laborious tasks. And you've got all of these sensors everywhere that are scattered throughout the entire operation. These sensors have in them some level of intelligence. They've got embedded processing typically inside of them. could be very low level where it just takes the data, repackages it, and then spits it back out over some wired communication channel. So all of this is happening. Or it could be almost like edge computing where there's actually some thinking going on before it sends the data off on the wired network. And then all of this is being pushed to some big controller. Think of the controller like a big server. And the server, the best analogy I can come up with is if you go to the symphony and you'll notice the symphony has a lot of people participating in it. You've got all these different musicians and they each musician plays one specific instrument. Now, if you're the drummer and he's hitting one type of drum, if you just listen to him on his own thing, it doesn't sound that well great. It's just boom, 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 boom. Then you've got some another musician that's playing, say, a, a violin. And well, that sounds pretty good on its own, but it's not complete. But then you have all of these other musicians. Well, guess what? There's another individual who's not playing any instruments at all. He's the conductor. And he's coordinating everything that's going on based on the input he's receiving from what's happening. And then he's conveying out the instruction to each of the contributing musicians of the symphony. So when we look at factory automation, the server's embedded systems act like the conductor in an orchestra, in a symphony, allowing, coordinating the activity with the sensors and also the the drive units to make everything happen. And what we're seeing is is that there's actually, if we take a look at the industry in general, AI is driving technology. The densification of processing power is, you know, going up orders of magnitude. If we take a look at a GPU, the, the one gener- current generation might be 300 watts. The next one coming out is going to be 1,000 watts. If we take a look at a rack, AI rack cabinet, today, I don't know, there may be 300 kilowatts. And then the next ones are going to be one megawatt. That's one megawatt of power per rack. So AI is driving technology, and this is flowing into the architectures of the servers that are actually being incorporated as the conductors of the automated factory. So the technologies we see in AI are actually going to 
they're flowing into the component utilization, the component choices, and the architectures of the systems for factory automation. Okay, good. What, what type of what other type of uh, challenges are the engineers going to face in trying to uh, use these innovations in, in in modern systems? Well, I think one thing Peter brought up a great example of bringing it up as an inductor, a uh, conductor. Now, when you start thinking about uh, maintenance of these systems, uh, you have the sensor inputs and you have your eye controller. One example could be you have a motor that has the vibration sensor that is critical for the function of the entire factory. Now, once you start having certain levels of vibration, a sensor is gonna be able to pick up what the amplitude of that vibration is. The AI controller can pick that up, understand exactly of what's going on with that vibration, but if there is a slight change, that could indicate that there is a problem with this motor that might not be critical at this point, but could later lead to failure and therefore a line down situation. So having a system like an AI detect that early on, it can now schedule proper maintenance for this device, replace the motor, add some oil, whatever needs to be done uh, for this particular scenario, but it can schedule it when, hey, we have a downtime scenario, we need to make sure that this motor is, is maintained to whatever level it's needed. And so that schedule can, can now be scheduled in your already busy schedule for your factory automation. And so that is a challenge but it can also provide some wonderful solutions because now you can avoid having a complete factory shutdown by preventatively maintaining the products as they bring up problems to your AI tool. So Simon, that's an excellent point. If we could just kind of elaborate on that a little bit further. When we take a look at AI and we take a look at factory automation and Pat's question, you know, challenges that design engineers have. The, the way I see this evolving is that the designers of systems for factory automation, they're actually going to leverage off of a lot of the work that the leaders in the AI are doing from a system architecture perspective and also from a component selection perspective. So, because they're the ones that are really driving the innovation right now. So I, from a hardware perspective, I see that happening. What One of the challenges for system integrators of this are, number one, because of the increased use of sensors, they're going to be pulling in a lot more data. And data is a wonderful strength if you know how to use it. So you've got data scientists that get involved that are able to go and manipulate and sieve through the data using some AI functionality to come up with things that should be done better or things that need to be improved or things that need to be done from a preventative maintenance schedule to allow this factory to run at peak efficiency from a throughput perspective, from a quality perspective, uh, and also from a power consumption perspective. And it is not going to be fixed in time. It's going to be evolved because as things are learned from the data, you, we may want to make adjustments in the process flow or the steps in the process to allow basically increased throughput, increased quality, increased consistency. Yeah, that's that's uh, very interesting. It uh, sounds like there's going to be a lot of uh, software involvement with this, with the, uh, with the hardware engineers as well. Um, so uh, looking ahead, um, what type of disruptive technologies or, or industry trends might shape, you know, the next generation of embedded controllers? Any ideas on that? Well, so the major shift, you know, in, in terms of controllers, I think we're going to see more migration towards risk-based architectures, reduced instruction set computation versus complete set or CISC. So basically ARM-based. ARM, -based. ARM is a, would be the dominant topology. I think that will continue. So that's number one. And then I do believe from, say, the server side that we talked about earlier, we're going to continue to see more incorporation of, say, AI functionality. So instead of just a x86 base processor incorporated 
into storing information and sending out instructions. I think there's going to be more intelligence put into it, AI functionality, which means that there's going to be more the addition of GPUs into the decision-making process for factory automation, or at least in terms of doing model development that would then be used by the factory automation. So generally, I see the trend is just more and more processing being involved. So factories are just not going to be about some machine going ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. It's really about flexibility in reactive manufacturing. Ideally, if we look at, you know, right now, factories are building the same product over and over and over, and it's going into a warehouse. I think over time, you're going to see factories that are far more reactive to changes in customer demand. And Pat, you mentioned um, the software and hardware integration. So if we start looking at um, what Peter was mentioning, there's going to be a lot of stuff that gets developed in the IT world first. In software, we heard about digital twins, where they can actually simulate the entire factory floor ahead of time before it actually gets implemented into hardware to make sure that they can improve efficiency and uh, work on this in a digital space before they actually implement it into a hardware space. And so with the integration of AI in those types of devices, you can actually test it ahead of time before you actually implement it. And that's a, a really great advantage to have the IT and OT world coming together and testing it separately before it actually starts being implemented in the real world. So that that's a really great example of how you can combine the two. Right, right. Good, you know, and I and I think uh, this this whole factory automation topic is is really important, especially very relevant right now in in, in our in our day and age. Uh, I'd I'd kind of like to wrap up right now. Any other comments that you guys would like, uh, Peter or Simon, before we wrap this uh, podcast series up? I think when we start thinking about factory automation, um, it's already something that's being implemented everywhere. We can order something online, we get it delivered the next day. That's a perfect example of factory automation. And we're going to see more and more of those types of things going into the future. And in along those ways, the engineers that are involved in these processes are going to have to make sure that everything operates efficiently and sensors and the passive components that go into those types of areas are just going to be an extremely important decision maker to have efficient devices, have enough inputs from the sensors and have proper brains making those decisions on where these types of devices go? Well, from my perspective, factory automation and really the evolution of factory automation is nothing new. I think in episode number one, I mentioned my roots being in the Blackstone Valley, the, the, where uh, the American Industrial Revolution began back in the mid-1700s, and it's still continuing today and I find this very, very, very exciting. So the way I look at it is this is nothing new. It's been happening for a very, very long time. It's continuing to evolve. And really, as it evolves, it increases quality, it lowers manufacturing costs, and frankly, it's improving the lives of society, basically because if you look at what's available in the store today, versus what was available in the store back when the American Industrial Revolution started, I suspect, I wasn't back, I'm pretty old, but I wasn't around back then. I suspect that there's a whole lot more choice in the store today than there was back then. And I think your purchasing power today was is quite a bit bigger than it was back then. So I embrace this as something that's very positive nothing new, and I'm very excited about it. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, uh, Simon. Thank the Yagio Group for uh, participating in our podcast series today. Thank you. Love being here. Thanks, Pat. Hey, thank you for having us, Pat. That's it for this episode of the TTI Distribution Download. For more information on any of the topics you heard about today, reach out to your nearby TTI branch at 1-800-CALL-TTI or visit us online at tti.com.